Father in heaven, and we ask again for your Holy Spirit to guide our thoughts and our discussion. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're on page 21, just talking about biblical theology of the city, some of the principles that we can see. Uh, and uh, we were really talking yesterday about how the city, God's new city, moving from land to city is a fact now. It's not a possibility. It's not like God calls us to make a city. God has given us a city. It's here. It's what the Holy Spirit is doing. And so because of that, we want to understand what it means, what the Spirit is doing. The city is not a mere symbol. The city is cosmopolitan. It's a place where foreigners mix with us. And hence, it's a mixed place. And as we were saying yesterday, there are dangers and uh, positive possibilities there. And here on page 21, we'll start in the middle, saying that city life, city life is not under the elementary principles. Paul in uh, his epistles uses the phrase elementary principles, ABCs, to refer to the world, uh, the first world. Not the fallen world, but the first world, the Adamic world, the world in which God uh, is going to instruct his children uh, with animals. God brings animals to Adam so animal, Adam can learn things. He learns there's nobody that's going to talk back to him. There's nobody that's going to add to what he already knows. There's no one he can dialogue with in the worship environment of the sanctuary. There is no co-worshipper. So when he says, why do the heathen rage? There's nobody who says, and the nations imagine a vain thing. When he says, don't eat it, there's nobody who will say, well, we probably shouldn't touch it either, which is true, of course. Uh, so he learns from animals. And throughout the old archaic time, the elementary principles, there are constant animal things, animal laws, animal proverbs, animal worships. We get to heaven uh, symbolically, uh, in the ritual of ascension by proxy in ascension, uh, Leviticus 1 by an animal. We lean our hands on the animal. We get on the back of the animal. We kill it. We put it in the smoke and it carries us up to heaven uh, to sit symbolically as the wife of Yahweh, as his Isha. That's all prophetic, but it's already partly true. Now, the elementary principles are gone. Uh, we are not living on the land. In the city, we don't need an almanac. Al almanacs are fun, but we don't need to consult any kind of almanac or anything else to know when to plant, when to plant this, when to plant that. Uh, we don't need it for animals or plants. We're not essentially living there now. And as a matter of fact, uh, as time has gone along, the need for actually observing stars, sun and moon, to know when things should be done on the farm is no longer necessary in the way it was in the before time. We live with people and not with animals. We made that point yesterday as well. But uh, one thing I want to say about that in the city, uh, some comments from Numbers chapter 35. Numbers 35 tells us about the Levitical cities. And just a, a few verses here. Numbers 35. I'll start in verse 1. Yahweh spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan opposite Jericho, saying, All right, we are right across from the land of promise, and now these rules are given. Command the sons of Israel that they give to the Levites from the inheritance of their possession cities to live in. And you shall give to the Levites pasture lands around the cities, outside the city. The cities shall be theirs to live in. Their pasture lands shall be for their cattle and for their herds and for their beasts. 
and the pasture lands of the cities which you shall give to the Levites shall extend from the wall of the city outward a thousand cubits around. You shall also measure outside the city on the east side two thousand cubits, and on the south side two thousand cubits, and on the west side two thousand cubits, and on the north side two thousand cubits, with a city in the center. This shall become theirs as pasture lands for their cities. All right. Uh, all the cities that you will give to the Levites, verse 7, will be 48 cities uh, and their pasture lands, uh, them with their pasture lands. Now, is it 1,000 cubits or 2,000 cubits? Well, you can consult the commentaries and, and uh, read all the confusion and discussion about that. But let's at least diagram the essence of it. Here's the city and its wall, and we measure a thousand cubits, we'll just make it one thousand in each direction, and now we form a square, which all of a sudden makes this a somewhat holier environment. Squares, circles do not exist in nature. They are always imposed upon the world as a second order of reality. The world as God made it, that first world, is made up of fractals, right? Underneath everything are paisleys, okay? By nature, it's a paisley world. Contrary to the Greeks, the planets don't go in perfect circles. They don't quite go in perfect circles. Even the Greeks knew that the circle of fifths in music is not perfect. It's a little bit off when you get all the way up to the top. It's one-eighth of a step off when you get up to the top. That's called the Pythagorean comma. Okay, nothing in nature is ever a perfect circle. And there are no straight lines. Uh, we have down in Florida where we were living a large sink, a circular lake of, that dropped out of the ground and it's at the center of the city of uh, Defuniac Springs. And it looks like a circle, but it's not. It's a little bit off from a circle. No circles in nature. But in the tabernacle and the temple, rectangles, circles, straight lines, that's imposed on. That is the second order of reality. That's the glorified world. That's the city world. And so the city essentially is a square. And that makes it a degree of holiness farther. And I pointed out yesterday that in, in this area, inside the city walls, if a house gets leprosy, that's a terrible translation, but if it gets what your Bible calls leprosy, if it gets the plague of affliction on the walls, it will have to be torn down if it doesn't go away. Out in the villages, that doesn't make any difference. If a person has the uh, touch of affliction on his body, uh, leprosy, he has to live outside. And he probably has to go outside this square boundary here. Now, outside this city is where the animals are. Okay, here's the animal. They are outside the city walls. That's the land area. In here are the people. And if you ever read in the Bible about a city that has animals in it, Something funny's going on. Like the last verse of the book of Jonah, where God says, I saved this city, and I care about the children who are too young to know their right from their left, and I care about all these animals. And as a matter of fact, the king has the animals put on sackcloth and go into mourning. That means that this city of Nineveh is not just a city, it is a what? If God is saving all the people there, including the animals, it's a ark, okay. And then when we talk about the new city, the new city which starts, you know, somebody was saying this morning that we moved from old participation where we are learning everything from animals and we were receiving everything from the outside to the new participation where it starts being authored by human beings from the inside, 
inside out, outside in. Well, if this is the year zero, it starts about 300 years before that, and the real change is finished up about 300 years after. You remember a lecture about that? Well, what do we have about 300 years before? We have the coming of the new covenant. The new covenant comes after the exile. It comes in its first form. It comes with God's empire that he sets up in Daniel. There are not four empires. There is one empire with four administrations of it in succession. And let's listen to what that empire really and truly is. It's in Zechariah. So I flipped past it. Flip. To Zechariah chapter 2. It's amazing how you don't turn to things in the Bible, you flip to them. And in Zechariah chapter 2, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. And I said, Where are you going? And he said to me, To measure Jerusalem, to see how wide it is and how long it is. And behold, the angel who was speaking with me was going out, and another angel was coming out to meet him. This is so clear when you read it. What? And said to him, Run, speak to that young man, saying, Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls because of the multitude of men and cattle within it. For I, declares the Lord, will be a wall of fire around her and be the glory in her midst. So there's going to be fire in the center and fire as a wall around it. And it's going to be so big that you can't actually build physical walls. Well, this is the restoration or imperial covenant time that in anticipates the new time that we're in now. This is an ark. It has animals inside of it. This ark sinks in Acts 27. The Roman ship goes down and everybody has to get off with Paul into the new ship of the church. But now, this is the Jerusalem without walls. And if, you know, in our course in Revelation, we discussed how Babylon, the mystery of iniquity, Babylon, uh, is not just the physical city of Jerusalem, it is this Jerusalem without walls. It is where these Jews have gone throughout the empire spreading the word, and then in Jesus' day, he says, you traverse land and sea to make one disciple, and you make him a son of hell. This project has gone bad. But the project of forming this ark, this Jerusalem without walls that includes animals, this is now the world city. That's what I'm leading to. We already have here in Zechariah this notion of a new holy world surrounded by God's fire uh, and everything now is holy. In the new covenant we don't have a distinction between holy and common. Uh, we don't, the elements of the Lord's Supper are not holy. They aren't made holy by some kind of a prayer and then you have to deconsecrate them at the end. They aren't holy in any more than anything else is. Every human being is, who is baptized is in Christ, and you can't get any holier than that. And if you're in Christ, you can't be any less holy than that. Okay, In terms of spatial holiness, or holiness by degrees, everything is now the same in Christ, and the city is holy. And so we live in a world that's a holy square that includes the animals and includes everything, but is now essentially city, the city world. So the city life, I'm saying, is not under the elementary principles. So what are the things that we can say about this city life? What's the city life like? Just some things. We can discuss this if I don't succeed in running out the time and have to actually take questions, you can raise them. But in a city, you have much more of a division of labor. If you look at the description of the Israelite gift of land, 
his, every Israelite has his vine and his fig tree, and you will not plant your field with vine plants. You will not mix these things up. You have, every Israelite has his ox. Every Israelite has some sheep. Every, by, you know, in principle, every Israelite has his orchard. Every Israelite has his field. Everybody's doing everything. Now there are going to be some specialists. There may be a blacksmith. But chances are that's just an avocation on the side of the Israelite in the area who's also doing everything. But you get to the city, you're going to have a division of labor. Okay? You're going to have uh, sanitation people. And as a matter of fact, in the city, this you're not going to have a field. You're not going to have an orchard. You're not going to have uh, animals. <coughs> you may have some cumin plants and some thyme. As Jesus says to the Pharisees, you tithe on your little vegetable cottage garden that you have on your roof where you have these potted plants. But he's actually describing city-type things that grow, your little herbs and spices that you can grow inside the city walls. In the city, you have this diversity of gifts. And that's pictured again for us in, the, in Corinthians and other places where he says in the church there's this diversity of gifts. He gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be pastors. Uh, some uh, have gifts of tongues, some have gifts of interpretation of tongues, some have gifts of prophecy, some have gifts of administration. Okay, or some better, some are, some of these people are a gift of administration. Some of these people are a gift of foreign languages. The people themselves are the gifts, not abstractions put on top of people. But that's the division of labor, which is part of the city life. And that means exchange. That means this phrase in, in Greek, alelon, Okay, A L L long E L O long O N. That means one another. It occurs 130 times in the New Testament. It's the big idea of mutual service. What we think of as servant capitalism. I, I look at what you need and want, and I make it for you, and you see what I need and want, and you make it for me, and we swap it out. And over the long haul, these things become much more complicated, but all true, unmonopolized, unstatist capitalism or free market is service. Each person serving the other and being served in turn, one anothering one another through this diversity of gifts and exchange. And that means, turning to the page, to facilitate that, we have a shift from a barter economy, essentially, to a money economy. A money economy comes in with the city. Uh, using metal for money enables you to cross boundaries, go from place to place. Uh, and so even in the city, uh, in the developed situation of, of uh, Israel, in the in the Jerusalem without walls, which is all in the empire. You get to Jerusalem for the sacrifices. You want to have Passover. You can't bring your sheep all the way from Antioch. You bring money and you want to pay the temple tax. Well, the temple tax has got to be paid in sacred shekels. Okay, your normal shekel, shekel is 20 giras. And the sacred shekel is a little bit heavier, is 21 giras. So you've got to convert your money. And if you come there with denarii or some other form of money, obols or something, you've got to convert that to shekels to pay 
your temple tax. The thing that you, it means you're a citizen of Israel. You have the privilege of paying that. And you've got to buy your animal with your money. You bring money. You bring weights of metal. And that becomes much more the way things are done than before, where you would essentially more likely swap out some cheese for some eggs with your neighbor or something else. Okay, and so you've got to have out in the city square, you've got to have people who are changing money and who are selling animals. That's good. Got to have that. Of course, what we're going to do is we don't want these Gentiles worshiping up here in the temple, so we're going to move all this stuff out into the court of the Gentiles and fill up the court of the Gentiles of the temple with these money changers and animal sellers. That's what makes Jesus real mad because his house is to be a house of prayer for all nations and he casts them out of the court of the Gentile back into the city square where they belong. In the city you can have high culture uh, which can be there as uh, next to, I have over here, folk arts. In, out in the countryside, you're going to have folk arts, you're going to have, you know, quilting, you're going to have other kinds of things. But in, the, in a city, you can have high culture in the sense that you can have an international trade that enables the development of painting and orchestras and choirs and whatnot because you have enough people together in one place. Cities look different. Okay, you've got to have a way of dealing with sanitation in the city, uh, so forth. Uh, for, and so you can talk about these things. Think what makes city culture different from country culture. And don't think, you know, what makes it different in 1920. Think of what made it different in the ancient world and what is changing. Because those things that you have in the city, that money economy, that high culture, uh, the diversity of languages that we're going to see is part of what has now made the entire world a city. Because of inter, uh, electronic communications, all these things go everywhere now. Stuff that used to be stuck in a city inside of city walls, well, after the invention of gunpowder and cannons, who needs walls anymore? They're a waste of time. <laughs> okay. Now, you may still build on a cliff next to a river, but forget the walls. But uh, what you have in the city, you used to have to go there to hear an orchestra. Now you don't. The city is polyglot. That means many languages. Glottis, tongue, polyglot. Uh, in terms of biblical language, polyglot would mean many religions, but we use it for many languages, and it is. God strikes down the one-language city back at the Tower of Babel, and He affirms the multi-language city at the day of Pentecost. All these people are there who speak different languages. They're all in the city of Jerusalem. Think about that, if you never have. How is it that we are all hearing in our own language? And then there's a list of 17 different groups of people there who apparently have comparably different languages or contrastively different languages. In the city, rubbing shoulders with foreigners means learning new languages, which changes how you think. If we speak um, traditionally of a liberal education, liberal education means learning a foreign language, right? so that you can think in another category. You can think differently from the way you grew up. Otherwise, you are stuck. And so the heart of liberal education used to be learning Latin so that you could speak with anybody anywhere because that was the universal language. Nowadays, it means learning English, which makes it easy for us. But a liberal education, when I was... When I was in high school, you had to have two years of some language. Everybody did. I don't know what that's like if that's that way now in public schools. But, you know, you hit the ninth grade and you picked. 
Okay, is it going to be Spanish or Latin or French? I don't know what they do now, but that becomes part of the citification of the vision of the world to be have at least some familiarity with another language. And of course now, with the gift of tongues, the gift of translation, which is what that means, the affirmation that the Bible can now, by the God's grace, be taken into other languages uh, with, by permission. You've made the Greek a Greek version of the Old Testament before, but the Holy Spirit had been poured out and the Septuagint has got some weird stuff in it. It may have some valuable stuff in it as well, but now God says, I'm sending my spirit to enable the Bible to be translated into other languages, and that carries with it now translating Russian novels into English, translating Balzac into English, translating uh, Shusaku Endo from uh, uh, Japanese into English, and whatever else, and vice versa. We can now participate in this citified world of many languages. Each tongue has its unique perspective on God and creation. Uh, one of the things in, in Calvinistic theology you learn is that Dutch theology doesn't look like Anglo-Saxon theology. And that's because Dutch is sufficiently different from English to where when you start doing Bible commentary and other things, you wind up, the categories don't look the same. They say things differently. And I'll tell you what, trying to translate from Dutch into English, it takes a two-stage process. I was, my first year in seminary, my, uh, the professor that I was working for, Simon Kistemacher, handed me a small book of theological propedeutic. What that means is, a description of all the stuff you do when you go to seminary. You learn Greek, you learn Hebrew, you learn this, you learn that. And there was a little chapter on each one. It had been translated from Dutch into English. And he said, oh, well, uh, Jim, would you uh, edit this? Well, I sat down with it and it was <laughs> almost unintelligible. Because when you go straight from Dutch into English, it's very strange. And I said, I can't edit this. What I can do is put it over here and retype it into English, <laughs> into better English, into readable English. It was a two-stage process. Uh, that's an example of how each tongue winds up with its own unique perspective on things, and over the next octillion years, we'll be learning all those languages, and each of them will give us a different and, and unique but true perspective on God. The gift of languages as we have it in the beginning of the present age, is the affirmation of the transformation of all languages in the new city. I said this. Now, the point was made uh, sometime today that when the gospel goes to a new place, generally you get some miraculous things happen, and then those miracles go away and the normal Christian world settles down. That happens at the beginning of every new creation in the Bible. God made the world rapidly in seven days, and then everything settled down, but those principles continue. God brought those plagues on Egypt in about two months, and then we go and we apply the same thing to the gods of Canaan over a longer period of time without the same degree of miraculous immediacy. God starts out the prophetic covenant by raising a little boy to life again by Elijah and raising another little boy to life by Elisha. And then the prophets come and say, God's son Israel is going to be killed, but if you are faithful, you will come to life again. In a more general way, the same principle is there. So we don't expect the gift of tongues as has existed in the New Testament to continue. The New Testament has been written for us in Greek. It's written in tongues, but some people... You know, there are some people who just learn languages. There's a guy in the CREC who, he knows Russian and he knows Hungarian. I mean, that's, just to say that out loud is, I mean, if you Hungarian is not even an Indo-European language. It's like guys who learn Korean. 
but it takes two years, right? Night and day. Uh, but then you read, read these guys, you know, they say, well, if you sent John Barrich down to Peru, just put him on the plane with a Spanish grammar and he'll know it by the time he gets off the plane. I want to kill people like that. <laughs> there are people who still have the normal form of the gift of languages. They have a skill in that area. All right, so it continues. It hasn't, none of these gifts have disappeared. They've just gone into a more normal form, the non-miraculous continuing form. The next point that I wish to make is to talk about how God impelled the people toward the city by means of the Jubilee law in the Old Covenant Old Testament time, or particularly under the Torah. Now the first thing that we see God do, and I don't have this down in your notes, is He moved the Israelites from nomad people to boundary land property holding people. When the Europeans came to uh, the New World, and when they came to what is today the Republic of South Africa, they met people who were living there. At the time, when they first got to South Africa, the people there were Khoisan people. Later on, Bantu-type people moved in almost about the same time. But they would go to these people and say, would you sell us some land so that we can have our cattle? Oh, sure, you know. Okay, we'll sell you this land. And then, you know, the uh, Khoisan people, Bushman people, those guys, you know, they, they come back through a year later and it's fenced. And so they just break down the fence and they're just moving through and helping themselves. And, and the, the, the Dutch say, you can't do this. You know, you sold us this. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, we sold you. That meant you could live there. We didn't say you could fence it and keep us out. And that's what happened. You know, we talk about Indian givers. Well, the Indians said, sure, you can have this land. And then the Europeans cleared it, which is okay. And then they fenced it. And then they said, you guys can't come in here anymore without our permission. Well, they, they never heard of such a thing. Okay. Boundaries. And you look at the, in the patriarchs in, in uh, the book of Genesis. They're not living with boundary land. They're moving from place to place. They have their headquarters. They probably have their their main tents, and those tents they lived in, if you want to see what a tent looks like, look at the tabernacle, and they had walls and all this stuff, fairly elaborate situation, but they were probably in one place for 20 years, but then they would go out, and they would have their sheep here and there, and there were other people, and there were probably general ideas, but it wasn't fenced off, but now when you get to the conquest of Canaan, God gives land to each family and says, this is yours. And the law says, do not move your neighbor's boundary mark. And if fire leaps over a wall from your property to your neighbor's property and burns over his crops, this is what you do. This is all new. This is probably new to these people. They've lived in Egypt. They probably haven't had boundary land there. Mostly they've been uh, slaves. The ones that were high-class slaves, like the Levites, worked in the palace as scribes and whatnot, but they weren't owning land like this. This is a different way to live than high-class nomadism. And now we move from the boundaries to the city because this is your land here let's let's make this uh, not a sacred square but lighthearted land okay this is lighthearted land all right and lighthearted has 10 eight sons has eight sons his firstborn is going to get a double portion. So we're going to divide this land up into nine portions. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, double portion here. And his firstborn son gets that. 
Now these are a lot smaller hunks of land. Okay? And each of his sons has seven sons. So we'll break up his property into uh, eight sections. And these guys aren't getting very much. So how is this going to work? Well, you know, farm, farmer Peter the third is going to lease out all of his brother's land and maybe his cousin's lands up here, some of them, and he'll have all this. And where are these guys going to go? Well, they can't get anybody else's land. They're going to go to the city. And gradually, there's going to be more and more people going here. And these cities are going to grow. And after a few centuries, we have Jerusalem and we have other cities there that are growing. Plus, foreigners who come into the land of Israel from the outside, like Hittites. Uriah the Hittite, he's a refugee from Hatti land, and he comes into Israel. Where is he going to live? He might lease some land. He might get adopted into a family and become part of it and get a little tiny two-foot-by-two-foot two piece of land over here. He's going to have to go to a city. Okay, That's why we were talking yesterday about foreigners being in the cities. The Jubilee Law, because this land reverts in the 49th year to the people that are in the family, they're going to have to go to the city. And so the cities have to grow. And God is impelling the people toward the city by the means of the Jubilee Law. They are pushed off the land into the more holy zone of the city. The more holy zone of a walled or fenced city where you can't have leprosy and be inside there. You have to live outside those walls until your leprosy goes away. Slightly more holy space. By the way, if you want to read up on all this kind of stuff, I have a paper called The Death Penalty in the Mosaic Law, and we'll, we will get it up online. It's one of the things we'll put up there. But I have one of the chapters in there is about all the different degrees, you know, the Israelite wilderness camp, and then when it forms up to become the war camp. And, you know, the war camp, if you've got to have a, a spade and go outside the camp to, to use the latrine. And if you have a, a, a dream during the night and you dream about your wife, you've got to go outside the city and you can't be having any sex as long as uh, the, the ark is in the field. If you find a beautiful woman that you like, you can't do anything with her. Uh, you can take her home and cut her hair off and pair her nails off. All her old glory goes off. She has to grow new glory. And you can't touch her for a month. This is an army that cannot commit rape. Okay? It's the opposite of the way the Russian army was ordered to proceed when they conquered Eastern Europe. Okay? Go through and rape all the women. That's the way you humble a nation. The Israelites are forbidden to do that. They can't do it. You can't even sleep with your wife. Uriatus says, I, I can't sleep with my wife. The ark's in the field. I'm still under orders, man, even though I'm back here in the city. David says, no, you're, you're not in the holy war camp anymore. You're back here in Jerusalem. He says, man, I'm still under orders. <laughs> all right, there are degrees of holiness for all these spaces. And the city itself is only slightly more holy than the land, but that's where people are being pushed. They're being pushed eschatologically into the new space into the new city. Jerusalem becomes a preliminary new city in all caps with a choir, orchestra, beautiful architecture. Uh, remember what Jerusalem looks like. I've never been there. At my age, I don't imagine I'll ever go there. But in the ancient world, of course this wasn't the only example of it, but you have this high mountain here and you have this city here and you have the temple, there's an even higher mountain over here, and the temple is on it. And the temple has got these silver lampstands 
that are burning all night long. So you look over at it and there's this light shining off of silver and you can see it at night. And then all of a sudden, trumpets are blown and there's a choir and an orchestra that starts to sing. And you're, you're on the caravan going down the King's Highway and uh, you're seeing this. You've never seen anything like this. Hey, more than one person is singing at a time. More than one musical instrument is playing. You don't have, have anything like that in paganism. Music means one person with one instrument singing an epic or something. This is unique. A bunch of people together singing and all this shiny light and this sound is going out into the valleys. By the rivers of Babylon, there we Levites sat down and wept, and we hung our harps up on the willows. And our captors said, please sing us one of those Zion songs. We've heard about them. Man, we, we want to hear one of those. Pick those instruments back up. Let us hear one of those things. One of the wonders of the world. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Well, you know the answer, right? If I make my bed in hell, you're there. Psalm 138. Okay, the answers are all given in the psalms that come afterwards. David wrote those psalms when he was in exile. So obviously you can sing the psalms in a strange land. That's where they were written. But there are all these answers given because now we're moving into the new age after the exile and we're going to be singing them in a strange land. But this is unique. It's, a, it's part of the city thing, the Christian city thing, the Christian temple thing. A bunch of people singing at the same time with musical instruments and making a lot of noise and shining out light uh, in, a, in a great place. Ringing bells. Okay? I don't know what would happen in, in our it, it, what would happen in Boulder if a church rang bells for 15 minutes at 10.30 in the morning on Sunday. Would that, would, would that a stop be put to that or would it still be allowed? It might still be allowed. Might still be allowed. See how that way we say that, yeah. 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 I really liked, uh, when we were in Scotland, we went to a large church and it was an Anglican church and uh, they rang bells. They had a set of bells. They rang changes for 15 minutes before the service started. That was really nice. You know what change ringing is, is you ring all these different bells. Dong, 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 dong. And you know, it's probably electronic now, but in the old days, if you were a change ringer, you, you had to know how to pull the rope, and then the bell rings. So <laughs> you have to get this real scientific thing going. And, and, Yeah. For half an hour every day at noon. I just think people want to know their hymns. Yeah. It's it's still there for a while. Yeah. It's like when people hear Big Ben, they don't realize that that melody comes from uh, Handel's Messiah. I know that my Redeemer liveth. That's the melody in Big Ben. So every 15 minutes, everywhere in the world, 24 hours a day, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is celebrated on people's little clocks they have in their house. <laughs> okay, people want to hear one of those songs of Zion because the new city is a unique place and it's because of this division of labor, choir, orchestra, architecture, whatnot. Sixth point here is the new creation happens whether people like it or not. And the example of that is the Jews. The Jews wanted to hold into, onto their land. They were forced out of it, and they were forced to live in cities. Jews have lived in cities ever since. Only converted pagan people, like the Khazars, who became Ashkenazi Jews, and some of the Russian Jews, have lived in villages and lands. For them, in Europe and in Muslim countries, they have lived in cities. They haven't been able to have their temple or animal sacrifices. 
they have had to live in the new way. They have had to live by a book. They made their own counterfeit New Testament. They have the Old Testament, and then they have the Mishnah, which is their New Testament. And then they have their commentaries on it, which is the Talmuds. And then all of their religion consists of studying the book. They are living in new creation categories, in city categories, in book categories. They're not living under the principalities and powers anymore. Uh, they're not living in the taboo world of archaic religion anymore. And the Christian civilization has always allowed Jews to have their own ghettos with their own laws inside the city. Now all of that began to become problematic when uh, Jews became secular and moved out of the ghetto. Uh, and then that become we'll discuss that in just a few minutes. But it raises the question of you know, Sharia law. You know, Jews didn't evangelize, so letting them have their own laws was not a problem. Allowing Sharia law is a problem because Muslims want to take everything over. And missions, okay. Just a comment here is that the new creation is happening through missions, and that is geographical dominion. We transform nation by nation. The demonic powers are actually geographically driven out of a place when the gospel comes. Uh, and uh, that uh, we, we could talk about that or maybe talk about it as the week goes along, but uh, the new creation is simply happening, and uh, the world is changing. All right, technology and the certification of all life today. Just to comment on the uh, sort of the jubilee situation that happened in, in Europe after the Middle Ages, uh, people, uh, wealthy people began to enclose land. It's called enclosure. I keep putting this pen down. And I'm not going to say anything other than When, <clears throat> when the common people found that they could no longer hunt in the lands that they were used to hunting in and could no longer use common land because the, the aristocrats had enclosed it, they had to move either to America, which a lot of them did, or to the cities. And then the cities become full of people and you begin to have your, all of your city problems that developed in England after that. Uh, uh, drunkenness, child labor, factories, and all the rest because people had been driven off the land by enclosure. But God was forcing into the city and forcing us to deal with, okay, how do we make the city livable? Because the city wasn't livable. And of course, uh, um, Charles Dickens' novels were reflections on the problems of city life at his time. The city comes into manifestation over time. The Bible is given to exorcise and demythologize as the gods are sucked out of human fears and as the world is demythologized, technology results, which is the extension of human beings as governors and transformers of the world. So... We were making this comment earlier as well that uh, science and technology are only possible as the world is demythologized and the gods are sucked out of nature. And as that happens, city uh, reality happens. Israelite reality happens, but the Israelites never got the picture. I mean, we read the prophets and we read the Old Testament and we have to remember that those were a small minority of people who were completely at odds with their society most of the time. Uh, archaeologists, once we get uh, uh, biblical chronology straight and the history of the ancient world straight, it's apparent that during the kingdom period of Israel, what we're finding is little idols and gods everywhere. Okay. They were full of Baalism and nature religion in Israel. And that's why the prophets kept having to fight against it. Okay? They, didn't, they didn't buy it. They didn't become sort of the proto-city life. Only at a few times in history did the Israelites do this. But now it's happening. Okay? Those little gods are not, 
around in our society anymore and they go out other places gradually as the gospel comes or sometimes rapidly as the gospel comes in. We can say today that farming today is a choice and not a bondage. People used to be bound to the land, you know. He who goes forth with precious seed weeping, he's only got so much seed left. If I plant this, I might not have anything to eat. Okay. God promises he'll come back with rejoicing, um, bearing his sheaves with him. But sometimes it can be a frightening thing. You're bound to the weather. And so maybe you'd better pay attention to the weather God out there. Maybe you'd better do something to make Baal happy. You really got to trust an invisible God who doesn't have any statues and who only has one place of worship way down in Jerusalem. That's, that's asking a lot when if it doesn't rain and you don't get Baal, it's not going to be Baal. If Yahweh doesn't bring the storms and you can't see him, there's no statue, there's no place for you to bring flowers and vegetables. I think we'll put some statues of Yahweh up here, maybe of his wife and maybe of his children. Okay, so we can put flowers at the shrine. God says you can't do that. I'll curse you if you do. Oh man, that's hard. Okay, that is life by faith alone. And they found it hard. But farming today, if people want to farm, it's a choice and not a bondage, okay? Uh, any return to the land is voluntary. For a lot of people, it's play and not necessity. What is that book, The $50 Tomato, about the guy that decided in New York City he was going to grow vegetables? <laughs> okay. But it's a whole lot cheaper to get them another way. And there's the famous story that the... Austrian uh, economist Ludwig von Mises, who was a deist, went to visit the Christian economist Wilhelm Röpke in Switzerland. And Röpke took him outside after they had had their, uh, their little glass of Tokai, uh, took him out back and showed him his vegetable garden and all the plants he was growing there. And von Mises thought that was pretty neat, but finally he looks over and he says, you know, Wilhelm, this is not the most efficient way to grow vegetables. And von Röpke said, Ja, Ludwig, aber it is a very efficient way to grow men. Okay. Sort of the difference between your evangelical Christian approach to uh, Austrian economics and a not Trinitarian one. All right. But it's voluntary. And it may be a little bit more expensive to make vegetables that way, but it may be as good for you to do it, good for your kids. All the world is city now. Radio, television, cellular phones, internet, music. All right, everybody listens to the same music around the world, or they can. And we can listen to other kinds of music. I have in my record collection all these neat, none such explorer records. I can listen to Balinese Gamelan, I can listen to a Javanese gamelan. I can listen to Koto music from Japan. I can listen to wonderful Paraguayan folk songs. I can listen to uh, the uh, music from uh, the Savannah in Africa. I can listen to Missa Luba, Luba which is a Catholic mass uh, with drums. I can listen to all kinds of neat stuff thanks to phonograph records. If you know what those are, you all call them vinyls, all right? Groovy. It's groovy. <laughs> hey, I'll ask you a question. On the average 33 and one-third record, how many grooves are on it? How many? Two. There's one on each side. There's spirals. I got you, man. You're going to say one. It has two grooves on it on a record, one on each side. But you know, if, if you live, I, I can now watch uh, Georgian or Armenian operas on YouTube, which are hobbies of mine. Maybe not your hobby, but they're mine. Uh, all this stuff is available. I don't have to go to Tbilisi to see an opera by 
Polyashvili. I can watch it on the internet. This is all city now. City stuff that you used to have to be in a city to see. I'll tell you something. When, when I was young, you know, once a year we'd get an opera. Opera would come to town. It would be La Boheme, which has about four characters and one set. And so you can take that on the road. I'll tell you what didn't get taken on the road was anything by Rimsky-Korsakov or Mussorgsky because you have to have huge sets and big choruses and you might have to have a marching band come up on stage and all this stuff. You have to go to St. Petersburg or Moscow to see it, but you don't. Just come to my house, I'll show you the DVDs. <laughs> I've had the pleasure of seeing them in person, but now you, can, you don't have to go. That stuff was never transportable because it's so expensive. It was for the aristocracy. All right, old versus new, the rebellion of the land. Oh, people say country life is better. Oh, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. You know what goes out, on out in the country? I have a friend from West Virginia. He's got some jokes. He said the West Virginia state legislature just passed a law uh, setting the drinking, uh, drinking age at 26 because they didn't want any high schoolers drinking. <laughs> All right. And he would talk about where he grew up, the amount of incest that went on, and how you could tell the kids who were children of incest because of their foreheads, and the distortion on their heads, and listening to guys on the bus make fun of one of the girls because of what her uncle had done to her that morning. This is bone-chilling stuff. Country life is better? No. Human beings are as depraved one place as another, and it's all a matter of what the people are like. You can make country life great, and then we have another way in which we have old versus new. In the 20th century, it was folk culture versus cosmopolitan civilization in Germany and Austria. Read the history of that. Cosmopolitan civilization in the cities was Jewish, and so the people of the land, blood and land, were going to take out these cosmopolitans. That was the word of abuse. And uh, that was all over Europe. Uh, in the early 20th century and late 19th century, and it was because the Jews had come out of the ghetto, and because Jews understood gold, they became wealthy, and they were living in the cities and creating a different kind of culture in the cities and merging in with Gentile culture, and this became a crisis. But the crisis was also a part of this rebellion against city life, which was land and blood is where we want to be. And then we have, a, I'm, I'm not going to get through all this, we have agrarianism in the United States, which was a neo-pagan nature movement among ac academics, particularly in the South, and uh, it wasn't too hard to link that up with racism, even if the men didn't. After all, you know, our colored brethren, they, they're so happy down on the farm with their banjos and their watermelons. Uh, they, don't, they, don't, they don't need to be you know, it's, it's only really a few of us academics with our pipes. <laughs> we don't want to go down there and pick cotton, but it's fine for them to because we know that agrarianism means uh, it's good for them. This is all the Galatian heresy writ large on a cu cultural canvas. The rebellion against the new, and I don't have the time to read that, okay, and I don't have the time to do the rest of these notes. But the heart of the new city is the church, the church is city, uh, all languages, one faith. The whole book of Romans is about this Jew and Gentile. Uh, God cut the Jews and Gentiles apart into two separate, partially dead bodies by the ritual of circumcision, which is cutting. That is now, that death is now resurrected into one new man in Christ by the resurrection of Jesus, and that is a sign for all such divisions by baptism to be uh, resurrected. Uh, in the book of Romans, Jew and Gentile mutuality is an example for the strong and the weak. Um, how diverse people can function by one anothering in this cosmopolitan body is the main concern in all the epistles and by ag acting in the right way the church patterns for society. All right. 
I hope this has been helpful in giving some biblical categories for thinking about the city. Let's take five minutes and come back for worship.